not a single example of someone being regenerated through water baptism to my awareness in the New Testament. That it is a means by which the forgiveness of sins is delivered through the sacrament itself. I, I see that as as unanimous in the fathers. Well, good evening, gentlemen, and happy whatever time it is to anyone that's watching this in the future. It is such a privilege to get to be hosting another one of these conversations on baptism. We are in our second installation of this series now, where we're talking about baptismal regeneration. In the first video, which went on Dr. Gavin Ortland's channel, Truth Unites, we talked about the subjects of baptism, specifically, should we baptize infants? And now we are getting back to the topic that initially gave rise to these conversations, and that is baptismal regeneration. And today we're going to be diving into that, looking at scripture and history, and I'm really excited to be here with both Dr. Gavin Ortland of Truth Unites, the author of several books, including the forthcoming book, Why God Makes Sense in a World That Doesn't, as well as pastor of, uh, he's the pastor of First Baptist Ojai, uh, I believe I said that correctly, and also you guys doubtless know him because this video will be on his channel, uh, but Dr. Jordan B. Cooper, author of several books as well, including the recent book, Union with Christ, Salvation as Participation, and the director of the Widener Institute, which you can find out more about that because this is on his channel. My name's Austin. I run a channel called Gospel Simplicity, and I am honored to be hosting these conversations. As I said, we're going to be talking about baptismal regeneration today. And I find it's always helpful to define terms at the beginning of a conversation because there's nothing more frustrating than seeing a debate or a dialogue in which people seem to be saying the same word but meaning different things and they end up talking past one another and going over the heads of everyone else. So to avoid that, can we start by just succinctly defining what is baptismal regeneration? Yeah, to, so to define baptismal regeneration, it actually is pretty broad, right? When, when we're talking about that, because there are a number of traditions that do speak about baptismal regeneration. Um, but we may approach the issue in slightly different ways. So there are different nuances to it and different perspectives that are under that broader umbrella. Um, now, we're using that term regeneration, which really is not all that common of a biblical term. Uh, it's used a couple times in the New Testament. Um, and in reference to baptism, uh, the Apostle Paul in the book of Titus speaks about a washing of regeneration. Now, there's going to be some debate over whether that's actually reference to baptism or not. But in terms of those traditions which are going to take that position, uh, we're going to say that there is a washing of regeneration. So whatever this thing that regeneration is, it's something that is brought about um, by, by baptism. So to say that uh, regeneration is tied to baptism or that there's a view of baptism or regeneration is essentially to say that uh, the waters of baptism, the sacrament of baptism, uh, when it is administered properly, that is in the name of the triune God, using the formula that Jesus gave us, uh, using uh, the, the, the visible elements that Jesus commanded us to use, which is water in the application of water, however you do that, and we can debate mode, uh, it, of course. But however however it is done, that it actually delivers grace to us and uh, delivers grace to us in the sense that it brings forth um, new life to the one who was baptized. So spiritual life is given to the one that receives the sacrament of baptism. Um, that is through the means of, of water. So through that means of grace, we receive new life, spiritual life, and also receive the forgiveness of sins. Now, again, once you get, I think, into the more specifics of that, you're going to find some differences of, about some of the particulars, uh, the question of what's the relationship between faith and baptism when we're talking about baptismal regeneration, or um, you know, what's the relationship between baptism and the forgiveness of future sins after baptism, or um, you know, there, there are a number of these other points that I think we can, we can see that there is some, some discussion about. But that's basically generally the notion that the giving of spiritual life occurs through the means of, of baptism. And by that, I mean water baptism, um, and not, not something that is totally divorced from, from the act uh, with water. Awesome. Dr. Ortland, uh, do you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, it's it's helpful to address this question at the front end. So thanks, Austin, for always doing a good job of kind of sketching these uh, the the flow of thought out here. And I just in agreement with Dr. Cooper about the diversity of this and the breadth of this. Um, it, 
pretty broad. You know, if you talk to, last time we mentioned there are credo Baptist groups that believe in baptismal regeneration, like the Churches of Christ. And if you're talking about a Lutheran conception, it will be a little different than a Roman Catholic view. And when we get to the Church Fathers, uh, I'm going to propose that there is kind of a, a kaleidoscope of, of different options for how it is sort of cashed out. And even just in what Dr. Cooper has said thus far, the phrase of giving new life, well, there's a sense in which I would totally affirm that, because I believe, as I said, that baptism is a means of grace. But um, in terms of does it impart regeneration? So to, to answer the question, I would say baptismal regeneration is the view that baptism is the means of regeneration. And I think for trying to get into the particulars here, uh, for the Lutheran view, to the best of my ability to understand, Dr. Cooper can correct me if this is wrong, we'd want to add in the adjective ordinary there. So we'd want to say that baptism is the ordinary means of regeneration, because I think as soon as we get into the examples here, we're going to see that all of our traditions acknowledge exceptions where um, it works differently from the norm. So um, just to plug some just and sinner books, if I may, <laughs> I've been, I've been uh, reading through some of these great uh, books that Dr. Cooper is uh, instrumental in bringing about, reading some of the older, because one of my concerns in these is I want to make sure I'm sufficiently distinguishing the Lutheran view from Reformed views that I'm very intimately familiar with. And so I want to make sure I'm catching all the nuances. So I've been reading a lot of Luther's sermons on baptism, and then a lot of these older, Charles Kraut, David Henkel, a lot of these older kind of you know, Lutherans from like the 19th century who are debating a Methodist on this. It's really fascinating. So I, I I think this is a fair representation of the Lutheran view. Dr. Cooper can correct me, can correct me if this is wrong, but it, it would be to say baptism is the ordinary means of regeneration. Um, and then therefore, as a consequence of that, baptism is uh, not absolutely necessary for, for salvation, but it is ordinarily necessary for salvation. Yeah, yeah, that's the traditional Lutheran language. So we would say that, and the Augsburg Confession does use the phrase that it is necessary for salvation, but while recognizing that there are some, there are certainly exceptions to that. You know, we're we're certainly not going to say the person who hears the hears the gospel, believes in Christ, has never been baptized, gets you know hit by a semi truck across the street and dies. That so that means, hey, you can't get into paradise because you weren't baptized. I mean, we, you know, we, I, Lutherans, after all, we do believe in justification through faith alone. Uh, and, and that's going to be one of the questions that I think a lot of people tend to ask us is like, how can you affirm these two things together, which I think they actually go very well together. But that's maybe further on. We can we can talk about that a little bit. But yes, I think that's that, that's certainly a fair, a fair representation. And, and as you pointed out, that's not just something that's unique to Lutherans. I mean, even in the Roman perspective, um, there is certainly going to there are certainly going to be exceptions. I mean, someone like Bernard of Clairvaux in, in the medieval church speaks about a baptism of desire. The early church spoke about a baptism of blood for those who were martyred who just hadn't gotten baptized yet. So uh, Christians who affirm baptismal regeneration, um, really none of them that, that I'm aware of would come down so strictly uh, on it to say that there is absolutely no circumstance in which one can be saved without baptism. And, and maybe it'd be helpful if I could just offer a definition of the word regeneration as well. That might clarify yeah, sure. as we go forward. And also just to say, to curtail us from uh, following a rabbit trail later, some people have argued that baptismal regeneration is necessarily works righteousness. And I'm not going to be making that argument. I, I think right. Dr. Cooper's right to push back on that and that it, it um, has some category confusions there. I, I do think you could affirm baptismal regeneration and justification by faith alone. So I won't be going down that route later. But I would say, just to be really clear, when we talk about baptism imparting new life, there's a sense in which I could affirm that. I would say the Lord's Supper imparts new life, you know. But I would say that regeneration, uh, so regenerative new life, you know, uh, I, I would say that's the initial um, act by which God brings us from death to life. So we, we are translated from a state of dead in sins and alienated from God to a state of friendship with God and reconciliation with God. So that's how I would define regeneration. Um, you, you go from dead in sin to alive to right. God. And so that would be just to clarify what I mean when I use that term. Yeah, I think even within, you know, even within the Lutheran tradition, if we're talking about regeneration, the, the term has really been actually used in multiple ways. And there's a little bit of debate about even what the right way to use the term is, um, because it does seem that the earliest Lutherans um, used the term largely to refer to uh, 
um, something that is an effect of faith. We, we believe as a gift of the Spirit, in, and after that, we are regenerated. Then we are given li new life in faith and the reception of the Holy Spirit. Uh, later on in the 17th century, as Lutheran theology develops, it tends to be the case that regeneration is actually defined as the giving of faith itself. That is regeneration. There are still other uses of regeneration that would use the term as something more broad than just one initial moment. And I think that's that's true in the Reformed tradition as well. You can find occasional individuals who use it something more like new life as in sanctification, like the entirety of the new life that you are being given uh, continually. So I think uh, it's important to clarify that just to say that the, the issue does get a bit complex when you're just using the term regeneration, because it is a term that, again, is not used that many times in the New Testament. So uh, it, it's a bit difficult, I think, to get a very particular definition, which is why we have to define what we mean uh, when, when we say it. So that's why I would say, um, you know, and you even brought up the, the yourself, the idea that we have new life through, you know, the supper or new life through, through baptism as well in your perspective in some sense. Um, and, and just to address something that, that I very often hear about the Lutheran perspective is people say, well, you do believe you can be born again through the word of God, as, you know, Peter says. Uh, and so what happens to an adult convert? Is baptism then just a symbol? You're basically a Baptist when the adult convert is baptized and only, you know, a baptismal regeneration proponent when the infant is baptized. Um, and, and I think it helps to say that in one sense, we can talk about spiritual life as something that is, that is continual. Um, so that I think we can even speak about a baptismal regeneration, even if you're already regenerate in some sense through the word of God, there still is an imparting of life. It doesn't make baptism just a symbolic act, even at that point. This is helpful as I think we're already opening up some fruitful lines of dialogue that we're gonna come back to. And I appreciate that. I want to start off, I mean, I guess we've already started, but as we delve into this a bit with a question that it, it might sound simplistic, but I think it's the question that so many people are going to be asking when they think about baptism. And that is, does baptism save? And I'd like to hear both of your perspectives on that, just so that people kind of have an understanding. We're, we're starting to touch that, um, but if you guys could go ahead and give your answer to that, and uh, we'll start with Dr. Ortland this time. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, maybe a good thing we'll be able to clarify early on as well, is I would say there's a sense in which absolutely baptism saves. Um, just to lay out my view, and then I'll give three metaphors. Austin has okay. talked to me before. He knows how much I love metaphors. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've got three now, but um, I've been thinking about these and trying to clarify them. But So I would say um, baptism is not the means of salvation, but the visible summative effect of salvation. I would see baptism as sort of the crowning climactic official expression and celebration of salvation. I've used the word metonymy to describe my perspective before, though I don't really insist upon that word too strongly, but uh, metonymy just means part for the whole. So an example of a usage of metonymy would be when we say the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. We don't mean the blood per se. Uh, as distinct from his flesh and so forth. It's not like if you touch the physical red blood, then you are saved. We mean the blood as representative of the events that we associate with Jesus's death on the cross. And similarly, I'd say baptism saves uh, in the sense that baptism is representative of salvation and the whole process of salvation that leads up to salvation. So some metaphors, my favorite one is the metaphor of a coronation ceremony. So when a king or queen is uh, officially recognized, publicly recognized as the new monarch, there's a coronation service where uh, there's regalia, there's, you know, oaths and uh, declarations and prayers. The new monarch is usually acclaimed by the people in some way. There's often anointing with oil and, you know, a, a whole elaborate public official sort of crowning moment. Um, but that isn't when they become the monarch. So uh, technically, they're already the king or queen by that point. Um, so they accede to the throne almost immediately in most cases. Like Queen Elizabeth II, for example, uh, there were 14 months between when she became the queen and when she had her coronation service. Her coronation service is this big event. 
at Westminster Abbey in June, I think of 1953, and it's broadcast to the world, everyone can see it. Um, and yet in February, I think of the previous year, February 1952 is when she, like within hours of her father's death, she's in traveling in Kenya and she becomes the queen immediately. So you've got the official public representation that is not causative of the thing uh, that it is celebrating and expressing. Another metaphor would be a graduation ceremony. Uh, if, when you graduate from college or whatever, a different degree, you go up during the ceremony and officially are recognized and you receive uh, your diploma and, and so forth. Uh, my college graduation was on May 13th, but you can act technically as a graduate for the purpose of job applications as soon as your coursework is completed. So on May 10th, I can fill out a job application as a college graduate. It doesn't tech, it's not technically causative of the event, it's the formal public recognition of it. Um, another metaphor would be a wedding ring. And this one is a little tricky and can get some pushback, but don't overthink the metaphors out there. <laughs> um, so this is how it can happen. So often the exchanging of rings is seen, usually it is seen as a distinct part of the wedding ceremony than the uh, exchanging of vows. And so that's not technically when you actually become married, and yet there are the words, with this ring, I thee wed. I've also used a fourth metaphor, becoming a citizen of a country, and it's as soon as the paperwork is officially recognized as opposed to some sort of formal you know, recognition at a public event or something like that. So my perspective is that um, just as there is no violation to human language, if we say the queen be was crowned in 1953, or we say, with this ring, I thee wed, or we say, I graduated on May 13th. So we may say baptism saves. It's not um, baptism itself as distinct from the events leading up to it, but it is baptism as their crowning moment and as their official expression. And I'm not trying to argue for that view now. I'll, I'll give some reasons as we go forward of why I think that's not just possible, but actually makes a lot of sense a lot of sense of the data we have to think of baptism like that. But right now I'm just trying to clarify kind of what my perspective on that is. Yeah. So I know we're going to get into, you know, some of the specific texts as we, as we move forward. So I'm going to try to give um, just a, a little bit of, I guess, of a summary of, of my position on, on that. Um, so essentially I would say, yes, baptism saves, you know, kind of, I would kind of give an unqualified yes. Um, and I think scripture itself is, is clear about that. I mean, Peter does use the phrase baptism now saves you, which we'll, you know, we'll get into the, the particulars of that section, which of course is a major part of, of this whole discussion. Um, so uh, essentially um, I, I believe that when we take all of the data in the New Testament and not just in the New Testament, I've also made the argument that I believe that this is, is typologically, um, there, there's much, significant typologically, uh, even including the, the spirit's connection with the waters going back to Genesis one, right? The, the spirit hovering over the waters being there at creation. Uh, and then the language of water and spirit at new creation, especially when we read like Ezekiel 36, the sprinkling of clean water, which occurs at the same moment as the, the bringing about of a new heart and the use of that kind of language as we get into then baptism in the new Testament, I think points forward to most clearly a, a perspective that would say baptism saves. Um, now, I do want to say this, though, uh, you know, because I don't want to give a ton of defense at this point since we'll be getting into that. But um, to, to clarify, uh, what do I mean that baptism saves? Uh, does this mean that uh, this is a, a human work that I do to earn my salvation? Right. This is and I know Dr. Orland isn't doesn't believe that I think this, but this is just for, for the sake of, you know, viewers who are maybe just curious about this. And it's kind of the, the initial question that of, often comes up. Well, isn't that works righteousness? Are you saying that, you know, that the, the, this water is magical or something like that? Uh, the language that, that Martin Luther uses in the small catechism, I think is very helpful when he says, it's not just the water by itself, but it's a word of God in and with the water. So when we're saying that baptism saves, we're essentially saying that the word of God saves. Uh, that God has attached his word to particular visible physical elements. And so one of those is baptism. And, you know, you can tie this to the fact that Jesus in various healings uses physical elements. He chooses to do that. So, you know, he, you know, spits in some dirt and rubs mud on somebody's eyes. You know, did, did Jesus need to do that? 
uh, like, what, was there something special about that mud? No, it was just mud, but uh, it's just it's just ordinary mud. But Jesus chooses to use that physical created object for the purpose of of a saving act. In that case, a physical literal healing. Uh, but I would say that that this is what's going on in baptism: is God is choosing to use this particular means. Uh, not because the water is magical or anything like that. It's not because the pastor is, has special powers or, you know, no, nothing like that. It's because God has determined that this is what he's decided to use. And so he's decided to use water and eat through that means of water, um, the spiritual benefits uh, of salvation are given to the one who who receives, who receives that baptism. I, I also do want to say as well, connected to that, that this is, ultimately our being saved via baptism is really our being saved via Christ. And I think when we speak about any of the elements of our salvation subjectively, it, it's all rooted in the historical life of Christ. It's rooted in that which is objective that Christ accomplished in his life, death, and resurrection. Uh, so we can say that our baptism is really a participation in Christ's baptism. I mean, think about what happened in Jesus's baptism. He's baptized, which is such an odd thing anyway, because John himself thought it was odd because this is, you know, for those who are repentant, like why does he need a baptism of repentance? John's really confused about this. Uh, but at Jesus's baptism, we have the spirit literally descending upon him. We have the heavens opening up. We have this, this declaration that Jesus is the son of the father. And so when we are being baptized, and, and Paul often uses that kind of language of baptized into his death or baptized into his resurrection, it, the language is really participatory. We're participating in Jesus. So when I am baptized, essentially, I am sharing in what happened to Jesus. Like, I get that same spirit that, that Jesus received at his baptism. Um, I am welcomed into the name of that same triune God that Jesus was declared to be among at his, at his baptism. And so we receive that status as sons in baptism, just as Jesus heard that public declaration of his own status as son uh, in this, this way uh, at his baptism. So I think that's just important to bring out to say, because there's so much misunderstanding, I think when people initially hear this, that to say that this is really about Christ and this is really about God using this as a means to bring us to him. Thanks for that. I think that's helpful to give that distinction for people who might not be as familiar with some of the nuances of the answer of yeah. yes, baptism saves, that they might think that's somehow apart from Christ. And I imagine, if I can plug it for you, that maybe that idea of participation might be covered in a recent book called Union with Christ, Salvation <laughs> as Participation. I don't know. But it it is. It is. Yes. <laughs> this is just what's on my mind at the moment. That's probably why I'm going there with this. But <laughs> Wonderful. So I, I want to start diving into scripture because... That, that's where these conversations come out of. We, we wouldn't be having this conversation if we didn't think that uh, these matters were scriptural one way or the other. And so I want to start uh, with you, Dr. Cooper, and you already mentioned some of the, the force of Old Testament typology here, as well as Peter's statement of baptism now saves you. And it just so happens that those things kind of coincide in Second Peter 3 there. And so I've heard you mention the crossing of the Red Sea, as well mm -hmm. as the flood, which Peter brings out there. Could you explain some of these typological arguments and how they, in your view, are an argument for baptismal regeneration? Yeah, I would say in, in some ways, my, my convictions surrounding baptismal regeneration and infant baptism, which you spoke about last time, really do in some ways center on the nature of typology. Um, because as I look at the the nature of typology and you know every other way as we see the shadow in the Old Testament and then the fulfillment which is the reality of what that shadow was pointing to in Christ uh, I think that what's often missed in a lot of typological discussions which you know are really common in say the reformed world and you know you read guys like a uh, you know, G.K. Beale or Meredith Klein or some of these guys who, who have really wonderful work in the area of typology. I, I feel like there are so many areas where there just aren't connections made in terms of the sacrament. It's not really the focus. And I think if you're up to apply a lot of those same principles that the reform generally use in terms of typology, seeing Christ as the fulfillment, um, as connected to the sacraments, I, I have a hard time coming away with anything other than a very strong tie between salvation and, and baptism. So uh, let me just, yeah, I can mention just a, a couple of these, but first I want to say this, because I think this is really key, is a principle of typology. 
that the fulfillment is always greater than the type. Okay, so the type is always the picture. The type is called a shadow. Uh, the author of Hebrews is kind of drawing on platonic language a little bit there um, to, to say that the real thing is what we have in the new covenant. That was just symbolic of what is the real thing, which means that the type is never as great as the fulfillment. And the difficulty that I have with the way that a lot of typology is used from those who don't hold to a you know baptismal regeneration in, in some form is that it doesn't seem that the type is really greater or the fulfillment is really greater than the type. So let me just say what the, those two two instances that you brought up, and I think there are others as well. But these are two connections that the um, the New Testament very explicitly makes itself. Um, so the first is is in First First uh, Peter chapter three, where you have this. And, and it's granted it's a very odd passage in many ways i think this part of the passage is actually not that confusing but uh to be fair the context in which it shows up is a little odd because we have this talk of noah and there's a bit of debate about what's going on there but but i think that the point that's clear he's talking about noah in verse 21 uh, and i'm reading from the new king james here he says there is also an anti-type which now saves us baptism not the removal of filth from the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward god through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Um, and I guess I should have maybe gone down back to verse 20 to actually make the connection explicit here. <laughs> but, but he's talking about the ark, uh, which is, that is eight souls were saved through water. So it, it's clear that there are some connections here. Uh, and the one is that uh, there is water in both instances and there is deliverance in both instances. So. What happens in the event of, of the flood, if you think about it, is we have an instance where God's wrath is literally poured out on the earth, on unbelievers, on the wickedness of the world. I mean, they're, they're literally dying. It is, it's not just you know symbolic of that, of course. This is God's wrath in the flood. And there is a real salvation that occurs, a real bodily salvation. That same water that is judging and destroying the unbelieving world is now the very instrument of salvation by which the ark is kept afloat and those individuals are literally saved from the wrath of God. So you see an instance of, of salvation there um, from the wrath of God in this visible man physical manifestation, which is connected to baptism. So now in baptism, uh, the connection he's making is just like this, baptism now saves you. And I have a hard time seeing that that connection really would fit if he doesn't mean that there is a literal saving that is occurring in and through baptism, just like Noah's family is saved in and through the flood. Now, people are always going to point out the next part of that, which is, he says, not as a removal of like dirt from the flesh or filth from the flesh, but as a pledge of good, a good conscience toward God. The, the point I think that Peter is making here is not to say, by baptism, I don't mean water baptism, which is what some people will go to, because the entire point of the parallel is that there's water in both. So he mentions the water specifically. Um, but instead he's saying it's not because it's this it's because your body's cleansed but instead it does something for the conscience we we, we can present our a clean conscience before god because of baptism which seems to me to make the most sense that he's saying that you have a clean conscience because you've received the forgiveness of sins in baptism which would connect well with what goes on in acts for example um so I have a ton to say, but let me just move. I'll do my quick Noah, or sorry, quick Moses in the parting of the Red Sea spiel here, and then uh, I can let Dr. Ortland respond because I'm sure he has plenty to say in response to to these, um, uh, to to this. So when we're looking at another example of baptism, and I bring this one up um, because this is again another explicit mention in the New Testament. So Paul Paul does this. He says that the Israelites were baptized into Moses, and. Um, you know, I mentioned this last time to say, well, here's a clear example of infant baptisms because it, it, at least that baptism had infants, right? Um, but Paul making that parallel is making a very specific and explicit parallel to baptism. And that is that, you know, the Exodus in some ways can be called the the gospel of the Old Testament. That's like the redemptive event of the Old Testament. Um, the theologian Robert Jensen, who I often disagree with, but I think he's right when he says that that god in the old testament is really identified as whoever rescued us from egypt like that's who god is to the israelites and uh i, I see that that you know that red sea event is kind of the redemptive event that they're often brought back to and really the whole story that that's a part of meaning the redemption from the egyptians with the um you know the passover and everything else as well so 
what's going on in that in that event of the crossing of the Red Sea? Well, they have a, a savior figure who is Moses, who's acting as a type of Christ here. And that savior figure is performing a miracle through water that the enemies of the people of Israel, the, the you know, Pharaoh and the Egyptians are trying to kill the Israelites. And the Israelites experience not a symbolic, but an actual literal physical redemption as this miracle occurs and as they cross through the waters. So this is something real. I mean, this is salvation. This is not a symbol of salvation. It's not anything else. It's this is the saving act is in and through the water. And then it defeats their enemies. So they're free from enslavement, literal physical enslavement. And now they are a free people. They've been redeemed by Yahweh. And, and that, that then identifies them. Like that's the identifying event. So if we're going to take that parallel and, and use the basic principles of typology, what's the parallel that's going on here? Which is, well, the difference is that's the picture. This is the fulfillment, which means that was the, it, it was literal and real, but it was a real saving from a physical captivity. Baptism now is, is the fulfillment, which is a saving from the spiritual captivity that we have. And so it's not just the physical Egyptians that are being drowned there, but it's our sin and our sinful nature. Um, and, you know, the power of the devil over us, uh, which is why we have these kind of renunciations of Satan so common, especially in early baptisms. Um, so to me, just putting those pieces together in terms of what was the Old Testament story, how does that then fit with what the New Testament is saying baptism is a fulfillment of? And, and when I read those texts, it makes the most sense of the text, in my view, in the nature of typology to say that baptism is saving. So sorry, I know that was long, but uh, there's my there spiel as short as I could probably give it because um, I could go on for way too long about this. <laughs> My answer might be on the lengthier side too. So um, I'll, I'll, yeah. what I'll do is try to pause halfway through so that we can create space for the, the back and forth, which is always so good. That so, sounds good. Um, Maybe I should have done that too after the first one. <laughs> it's a too, no, big, no. too big text, but go ahead. No, all good, all good. Um, yeah, maybe just to start with, because I think what sometimes happens is people refer to these passages in the New Testament that speak of baptism as having a saving efficacy in some sense. 1 Peter 3.21 is the one that's come up. There's about six or seven others that often come up in these discussions. What I often find is people will simply quote these verses and then just abstract from them baptismal regeneration, in my opinion, far too quickly, as though that's sort of the immediate or obvious conclusion to be drawn from them. And to me, it's kind of similar to when people quote, this is my body, therefore, transubstantiation. And it's, and it's kind of too neat and quick a movement to where the questions that I think we need to ask are, are being glossed over, like, what does the word is mean in the statement, this is my body? Which actually is not easy. Whatever you view you take, at least it's worth asking the question and getting into the historical vetting of that question and kind of working through that. Similarly, with a statement like baptism now saves you, I think no one takes that literally in every sense, and I'm going to unpack my views on that verse in just a little bit. But so, so maybe to start with, what I can do is just give two reasons why I think it's it, not only reasonable but somewhat instinctive and unavoidable to to wonder at the degree of literality in these New Testament passages. Uh, how literally do we take them, or if that's not the right way to put it, just put it more broadly. What exactly does it mean when Peter says baptism saves you, and why I think that's sort of reasonable to, to wonder at. So one reason would be um, just what baptism is as a sacrament. So I would say that it's inherent to what a sacrament is, that there is linguistic complexity in how it functions, because it is a representative event. It's a symbolical event. So it's I'm not saying it's just a sign, but we can certainly agree it's at least a sign. It's pointing to something. And there does emerge this complicated relationship between sign and thing signified. And I'm going to argue that one is often used as a stand-in for the other. And so I'll come back later to Ezekiel 36 and some other passages where I'd say there's unavoidable passages in Holy Scripture that talk about cleansing water and that they're not talking about baptism. And so I'll come back to that. But I would say baptism is the one part of salvation that's visible. You can't point to someone being justified and say, wow, look at that justification happening right there. OK, uh, you can't point to someone being adopted as God's son or daughter and say, there it is right there. Um, baptism is the thing you can point to. 
Baptism is also the formal and public uh, moment of salvation. I, uh, in context of my research, I uh, interviewed a few pastors for one of my books. One of them lives in Singapore. He was telling me that uh, the students, the university students at his church, uh, don't get backlash for going to church, reading a Bible, and even asking Jesus into their heart. But they do receive backlash for baptism because that's the crossing of the Rubicon moment. And I've read about in other places as well, there's a similar dynamic where baptism is sort of the formal. So I would say there's, you can look at baptism and say, that's salvation. There it is. That person is now a Christian. Now, that's not to say necessarily that it is causative of salvation in some sense. And so, in other words, the very nature of what a sacrament is, just as we wonder at the meaning of the words, this is my body, at least create the possibility of linguistic complexity and at least should generate us to saying this isn't a dumb question to wonder what does it mean? Like how literally is it baptism itself? Um, the second reason I think that's reasonable is, as we probably all agree here, faith also saves. And so what you have is in cases where there is a temporal gap between baptism and faith, you have two distinct uh, moments that function as causes for one effect. So you've got two different effects, or excuse me, two different causes and one effect. Uh, the effect being salvation and the causes being um, baptism and faith, converting faith. So if your friend borrows your car and comes back with a flat tire, there will be more metaphors, don't worry. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, uh, if your friend borrows your car, comes up with a flat tire, and you say, what happened? And they say, well, I nailed a curb, and then a half mile later, I ran through a construction site that had lots of nails. You, It will be instinctive to wonder which of the two causes created the flat tire, or, or was it 50-50 or something like that? It's, it's, it's instinctive to wonder about that. And what I see happening over and over in my ministry, and later we'll talk about the Book of Acts, is people look like they get regenerated at faith. Um, so here's another metaphor. Suppose I have a friend named John. John is dramatically converted on January 1st. John is baptized on October 1st. What I see over and over and over and over in my ministry is they look regenerate in February, March, April, etc. Now, obviously, you can't know for sure where someone's heart is at, but they give all the fruits of regeneration for that 10-month catechetical process, and that generates the question. Now, Dr. Cooper alluded to this earlier, that we all acknowledge that can happen. Thomas Aquinas has passages in the Summa Theologica where he'll talk about how you can get regenerated at faith rather than at baptism. So I'm not saying that that's at odds with a baptismal regeneration perspective. But let me read how the Lutheran theologian Johann Gerhard puts it. He's one of the great sort of scholastic Lutheran theologians. He says, quote, when, therefore, they are baptized who have already been regenerated through the word as a seed, they have no need of regeneration through baptism, but in them, baptism is a confirmation and sealing of regeneration. Now, that's essentially my view. But what he would say is the exception for adult conversions, and in some cases, I would basically just say that's more the norm. Now, we can talk about that as we go forward, but my point just now is, um, what Gerhard envisions there, or what I am referring to with my friend John, that's not at odds with 1 Peter 3.21. I'm happy to say baptism saved John. Um, so we have to be able to interpret these verses that um, accounts for those realities we all acknowledge. No one thinks it's always baptism per se. And there's a lot of nuances in these passages that is, tend to get, in my opinion, kind of glossed over if all we do, just as we'll talk about with the fathers as well, if all we do is say, you know, the Bible teaches baptism saves, therefore baptism or regeneration. And that feels to me like Jesus said, this is my body, therefore transubstantiation, because of this linguistic complexity that we've got to wade through and work through the nuances of that. I mean, I would say that with 1 Peter 3.21, you don't need baptismal regeneration for the antitype to be greater than the type. There's so many points of disanalogy between the flood of Noah and baptism. Uh, one of them is that the waters were destructive. The waters were not the instrument of salvation. The ark was. Another is eight people, <laughs> as opposed to every Christian. 
Um, another is it doesn't say that you you make an appeal to God once you're baptized or baptism allows you to make an appeal to God. It says baptism is an appeal to God. And no one who thinks, an, and I would say that who's making the appeal, and I would say it's the baptizant is the best way to take that. No one takes that literally with an infant. Like an infant is, in from a personal standpoint, making an appeal to God. So I would say there's, there's lots of ways that these uh, verses, and I have, I, I'd like to kind of extend out into some of the other passages in the New Testament, but maybe that'd be a good point just to pause and see thus far, I'm trying to say what a sacrament is and its relation to saving faith generate complexity that should make us all have a lot of patience for the question, how literally do we take this? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot I have to say about that. <laughs> so these are good. These are good talking points for sure. And uh, yeah, th there's just so much I could get into with each of those. But let me just say a couple things. In terms of the of the first thing that that's brought up, uh, I mean, I would say linguistically, this is my body means this is my body. I mean, that's that's a, a Lutheran contention as well. So, um, so for you to point that out is, you know, I I would say, well. Yes, I think we should take that literally. So I think there's going to be a difference in terms of, of how we approach sacraments in general. Now, it, it has always been the case uh, within, within Lutheran thought as well that sacrament, though we can speak of it as a general category in some sense, we, we are never to first determine a definition of what sacrament is and then import that, then put those other things that we call sacraments within the definition. So in other words, it's it's that the Bible says a lot of things about baptism. It says a lot of things about the supper. It also says things about absolution, but that's a whole other discussion. And that the church, historically, because it recognizes some similarities between these things, they are, they are given by Christ uh, for the um, you know, benefit of the church and as means of grace. The church has chosen to use that term sacrament to define those things. In other words, we're, we're not going to make an argument from this is what sacrament is, therefore it applies in this particular case. Um, uh, with, with that being said, uh, then you get to, if I could address the, you know, the, the second argument there, um, that, that, you know, salvation, you have basically two causes of one event, right? Which is salvation. Now I would say when I'm speaking about salvation, I think it's wrongheaded to think of salvation, first of all, as a punctilier event in the Christian's life. I mean, as the primary way to speak about salvation at all, um, I would say that that if there is a you know punctiliar singular event that is our salvation, it essentially is Christ. It is Christ's historical life, death, and resurrection, and in His life, death, and resurrection, He has earned salvation. He has uh, He is justified at His resurrection. He is vindicated uh, before the Father as representative of His people, and salvation in our, our in a personal sense, when we receive salvation, that is essentially a bringing of ourselves into the objective event of salvation that is essentially Christ's own life, death and resurrection, his accomplishment of salvation. Now, why, why that's relevant is because anything that connects me to Jesus is a saving event in some sense. So that I'm not just thinking about the moment that I first had faith. Can we think, can we talk in that way in a sense? Sure, of course. There, there certainly is a moment that that we move from death to life, you know, that we were under wrath, now we're under grace. I mean, scripture does absolutely use that kind of language. But also when we speak about, you know, salvific terms, whatever the terms it may be, let's take, uh, let's take justification, say. Um, look at, you know, Romans chapter four, which is a text that I, I uh, you know, often go to, and I've gone to in my dialogues with Roman Catholics on justification. I love Romans four. Uh, I'm convinced that the Roman treatment of that just is not adequate and they can't, they really cannot sufficiently explain Paul's argument, but um, that's beside the point. But the, the point of bringing up Romans 4 here is that in Romans 4, Paul gives examples of justification by faith. And his examples of justification by faith are not conversion experiences. Uh, there, There's Genesis 15, which is, you know, Abraham receiving the covenant promise that he already received in Genesis 12. Uh, we know that Abraham already had faith because in Hebrews 11, he's an example of faith prior to Genesis 15. Uh, he's one of the, he's a hero of faith even at that point. And then we have Psalm 32 of David's confession of sins and forgiveness, which certainly is not his conversion experience. We know that he speaks in other Psalms about 
you know, trusting in God from his mother's breast, as we talked a little bit about last time. So the, the point of, of bringing that up is to say that when we speak about salvation, and salvation is a, is a broad category, but I'm just focusing on one aspect, which is justification. Scripture can use the language of justification to refer to a lot more than just an initial conversion event. So that I would have absolutely no issue with saying that faith saves and baptism saves. Um, and, and I mean that, you know, in a literal sense. I mean, it's always a hard to say literal sense because what does that mean? But um, <laughs> but in a sense that it really does do a saving action. It is, it is, it is applying the benefits of Christ to us concretely, um, but that this occurs all the time. Uh, so, so I would say that something like justification is not just a singular event, but it's continual. So if we're speaking about the forgiveness of sins, um, why is it that, you know, in the Lord's Prayer daily, we're asking for the forgiveness of sins? If we just had the forgiveness of sin to justification and our future forgiveness is really just that one-time forgiveness. Well, there's certainly a connection between the two, but we're continuing to receive the benefits of that as our life goes on. So in light of that, I don't think that there's a problem there in, in what we're saying temporally, unless you're going to conceive of salvation as a one-time event, which which I'm challenging that that's, that's the primary biblical mode of speaking of, of saving or, or salvation. Let, let me just clarify one quick point, and then if Austin sure. to jump into, feel free. But um, with regard to transubstantiation, I, I didn't say this is my body doesn't mean this is my body. I said the movement from this is my body to transubstantiation, which is a particular understanding of that. And that's the parallel that I'm drawing with baptism from the statement, baptism now saves you, to the understanding of how baptism saves and the acknowledgement that people like Aquinas and Gerhard make that sometimes you're regenerated at faith, temporally preceding baptism, is draws attention to the um, complexity of understanding. Well, how and in what sense does baptism save? With regard to the punctiliar nature of salvation, I'd just be curious with the specific term regeneration, just a question of ignorance, truly. Did, it would yeah, be, yeah. be your understanding that that is a punctiliar event or would you say regeneration also is a sort of ongoing or, or a process or something like that? I would say that it can be spoken of in both ways. Um, which, you know, this is something that, that um, in an Ordo Salutis in, in some of the older Lutheran scholastics as well, even when they talk about conversion, they can talk about daily conversion as well as conversion in the sense of initial initial act. So I'm comfortable speaking in both ways. So okay. regeneration as that initial event, sure. But is there a daily reality of my my being regenerated continually? Sure. I think I'm, I'm, I'm okay talking that way as well. Okay, that, that then then to some extent, some of our differences may be terminological um, because what Gerhard expresses as, from my vantage point, is sort of an exceptional case from a Lutheran perspective um, yeah. is something that I would affirm. Uh, that's basically my view when he talks about the, the baptism for those who are already regenerated is a confirmation and sealing of their regeneration. So if baptismal regeneration simply means that, you know, you're, you're given new life, but it's sort of subsequent to your initial regeneration, then our views would not necessarily be in disharmony. I'm not accustomed to thinking of regeneration that way. I'm not off the top of my head aware of kind of biblical precedent for that kind of language. But if there is, if that's how regeneration is defined, that in a more elastic way, then to some extent we're not as far off. But what, what I mean to exclude when I say I don't affirm baptismal regeneration would be what I how I defined regeneration at the beginning, that initial translation from state of uh, deadness, spiritual deadness to state of spiritual life. I don't know if that clarifies or not. Yeah, I think um, one of the things when you look at someone like Gerhard, and Gerhard is like... Uh, I, you know, in my list of like theologians that are in, you know, influence me, I, Gerhard's the, the top of the list, you know, without a doubt. I, I think he's the best theologian our tradition has, has uh, created even uh, better than Luther. But um, I know it's terrible for me as a Lutheran to say that. Uh, I, I love, I love Gerhard. But the reason, what I was going to say is, I think this is an area where I, I think Gerhard and the other kind of Lutheran scholastics coming from that era um, where they don't develop things well enough is exactly with regard to that question, because they don't really spend a significant amount of time developing what that means. And I think some of this is the fact that it was a very different cultural circumstance. I mean, in Germany, like the infants are all baptized. This is the 
expectation. So they're not wrestling with the issue, I don't think, enough in a way that Lutherans have to think much more about this in an American context, in a more of a revivalist context, where it's not just kind of a given that, of course, the infants are going to be baptized. So so I would say that, that Gerhard does not, as much as I hate to say this about Gerhard, sufficiently treat the subject. Like, I, I'm not sure that I would affirm exactly what Gerhard says. I, I don't know that that's a great response, personally. Interesting. Well, if, if you don't mind, Austin, if I could just finish off quickly my response on the whole issue of biblical language, and I just want to make, uh, it might be helpful just to articulate kind of a new thought, venturing out into a new direction to some extent, but just briefly to say basically my general approach to the interpretation of this New Testament language, and that would be, I would say that there is a broader uh, spiritual reality of cleansing that is often spoken of with reference to water, that baptism participates in but does not exhaust. And not every reference to cleansing with water is a reference directly to baptism, though baptism will recall it. And this is again why, as you get into this, there the linguistic complexity is unavoidable. And I, I would just say, I just think, as soon as you start pressing into what does baptismal regeneration mean, a lot of the, the neatness around it starts to fall away pretty quickly. So I would say, it, throughout the Old Testament, the language of cleansing water is often used in contexts that I don't think are plausibly taken to refer to baptism. Ezekiel 16, 9, Ezekiel 36, 25, there's lots of sprinkling language too, which I, so Ezekiel 36, 25 talks about, I will um, sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. It's talking about the Holy Spirit being given, being given a new heart. I think it's talking about regeneration. Now, when the New Testament picks up this language, um, which I actually think the verb sprinkling there, although not positive, might be referring to the blood sprinkling ceremonies and kind of mixing metaphors. But when the New Testament picks up this language, none of us think it's always talking about baptism. And a lot of times people insist that on, you know, if it's water, it's got to be baptism. When you're talking about, and the camera will come just right back, when you're talking about like John 3, but you just keep going in John to John 4 and the woman at the well, and no one takes all of these references to water as literal or as baptism. In fact, in John 7, 38 and 39, Jesus speaks of water flowing within, okay? I think this is the common imagery from Ezekiel 36 and elsewhere, and John is explicit. He says, he said this about the Spirit. So what I would say is when we look to the texts where it's talking about that are often stacked up as proofs of baptismal regeneration, um, many of them not only are not necessary to read as directly referring to baptism, rather than recalling baptism as they refer to the thing it points to, so the, the, the thing signified rather than the sign, but many of them are awkward to take in that way. Uh, it just occurred to me as I was thinking about this over the last two days with Hebrews 10, um, and the, the injunction there, Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, there's the appeal, this is the first passage I ever preached on, so I always, I, I love this passage, but it's, uh, a calling to keep going to church, basically. And it's spoken to Christians and uh, drawing near to God, okay? And then there's the injunction, having our consciences cleansed. And then it says, having our bodies washed with pure water. Now, these are already baptized Christians. The very next sentence is, hold fast your profession of faith. Okay, uh, we, he's already talked about washings as an elementary part of the faith that we're moving beyond in Hebrews 6 too. How do you get, what does it mean to wash your body with pure water if you're already baptized? So um, it looks to me like that text is talking about the spiritual cleansing that baptism points to. Now that will recall baptism. Baptism is the fulfillment of that. Baptism points to that, but it's not the, directly baptism itself. Similarly with Ephesians 5.26, where there's the reference to the church being cleansed um, by water through the word. And I think this is drawing from Ezekiel 16.9, where God is speaking to Israel. And he says, I bathed you with water. Okay. And when you've got a collective entity like the church or Israel that is cleansed with water, uh, the question is, when did that happen? If that's baptism, literally. There was no collective baptizing of the entire church. I think it's talking about the um, the spiritual cleansing that Christ affected through his death that baptism points to. I could go on with these other passages. Just for the sake of time, I'll just say there is linguistic complexity in how, in whether you're talking about the thing itself, 
or the thing as illustrative and as symbolical in the function that it that it plays. I, I want to get to Acts chapter 10 and Cornelius and the relationship between conversion, baptism, regeneration. Uh, but before we go there, just for the sake of the audience, um, I could have missed it, uh, but maybe if I missed it, they did too. So that's helpful going through the various passages uh, where water is referenced and questioning whether these types are valid or not. Um, I think that'll be fruitful for people. Just in a, in a quick answer, for the specific types uh, that were drawn out uh, in the question of the crossing of the Red Sea and the flood, uh, maybe even if you just want to pick the flood as uh, we've got that in First Peter 3 there, do you see that as a type of baptism? And is that the point of maybe pointing towards baptism or the thing that baptism causes? Anyway, I just wanted to get clarity on that before we moved on. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for uh, clarifying that. I do think it is certainly a type. In fact, Peter uses the Greek word antitipon. Okay, so it's it, he calls it. It's usually just translated like, I think the ESV is like, this refers to baptism, but he's saying it's an antitype of baptism. So yes, the typology is explicit. To be brief, since you asked for brevity, I would simply say, I don't think the typology results in baptismal regeneration. I don't think that follows from the typology. Thanks. That, that's helpful. I just wanted to make sure if people missed that or they were wondering um, the relationship between those things, that they, they got some clarity on that. So now going to Acts chapter 10, it's the story of Cornelius, and many people will probably be familiar with it. If they're not, they can go ahead and look that up, and I'm sure you'll give uh, a little bit of it here. Um, but could you flesh out how this story of Cornelius and Peter you know, seeing his conversion and saying, well, who can stand in the way of him being baptized? How does that inform your view of baptism, specifically in relation to this question of baptismal regeneration? Okay, I would say with respect to Acts 10, as well as the other four pivotal texts that I see in Acts with regard to baptism on this question, Acts 2, uh, Pentecost, Acts 8, Acts 9, and Acts 19. I would say that in all of these, without exception, spirit baptism and water baptism are not coincident. And so that um, now, now let's try to be as fair as possible on this. These are unique circumstances. Some of these passages are strange for all of us, especially Acts 8. And the counter argument, of course, is that these are redemptive, historically unique events that are showing the expansion of the gospel to new groups, such as the Gentiles in Acts 10 with Cornelius. And I would say that's plausible, though the text doesn't say that, but I'm not sure that that necessarily drains them from relevance to this question. And the simple observation would be that in every one of these cases, without exception, um, baptism is not coincident. Water baptism and spirit baptism are not coincident. So with Cornelius, I would say Cornelius is the scenario Johann Gerhard acknowledges and the John metaphor. Response to the gospel, Holy Spirit reception, speaking in tongues. Peter says, look, they got the spirit just as we have, therefore baptism. I would say that's the pattern. I would say that's Paul, even Paul in Acts 9. It, it, it says that it's when Ananias lays hands on him, that he receives the spirit and is no longer blind. Subsequent to that, he is then baptized. Now, if the response to this is, oh, these are exceptional circumstances, these are exceptions, my question would be, how many exceptions do we need before we start stop calling it the exception and start calling it more of the norm? Because I see that circumstance, what happens to Cornelius over and over and over in my ministry. So how many exceptions do we need? Meanwhile, we've got not a single example of a rule against which they are measured. There's not a single example of someone being regenerated through water baptism to my awareness in the New Testament. So um, I guess I would just say the sort of question would be, how many examples of like this would we need without any counterexamples before we'd start to say, well, this looks like more or less the exception and more the norm. All right. Um, yeah, there's there there's plenty I, I could say in response to that. I, I would say a, a couple things. One is, that it's not just that there are tons of exceptions. I would say that there are a number of passages that explicitly tell us within various epistles, as well as gospels, what baptism does. And so I would point to texts like, like the ones that, that I had mentioned. So, so I'm not saying that we take all of our theology directly from the narrative of the book of Acts. 
I, I think that that is the wrong approach to the doctrine, especially when we have very explicit texts and we can look at passages like Romans 6. Um, I, I still hold on very strongly to the typology in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, and I think even if you point out the, you know, of course, differences between the flood and baptism, of course, there are those differences. Um, but the question is, what are the similarities that the author himself is pointing out? And he's very explicit that there are two similarities. There's the use of water and there is salvation uh, in both in both circumstances. So I, I think, and I hear this a lot where people point out, you know, well, the water didn't really save, the ark did. And, and in some ways I say, well, that's kind of, that's an argument with Peter. You know, that that's not an argument with me because Peter's the one making the connection. Peter's the one saying they were saved through water and you are saved through water that is in baptism. So I would point to a number of different texts. Uh, I think they're, you know, as, as again, I you could point to texts in Galatians and the book of Romans that speak about, about baptism. I, in fact, I would say, you know, nearly every text that speaks about baptism um, that is more than just a narrative about someone being baptized that speaks about the function of baptism. I mean, nearly every time it is regenerative language or language of salvation or forgiveness or uniting to Christ, something that is indeed indeed salvific. So uh, I would say when we're looking at, at the book of Acts, uh, that I, I do believe that there is, is uniqueness to the redemptive historical situation that is in the book of Acts. And, you know, that's something that's not just true from my perspective in terms of, of baptism, but that's true from any perspective of things like the spiritual gifts and the apostolic authority. And, you know, everybody's going to acknowledge that there are differences in terms of the initial spreading of the gospel in the book of Acts than the normative function in the church in some way. So I think the question we have to ask is how is it that baptism plays into that? Now, the first instance of baptisms in the book of Acts, I would say is about baptism regeneration. Uh, I would say that that uh, in Acts chapter two, verse 38, um, you know, I think we, we have an instance where we have in verse 37, a number of individuals asking basically about how they can be saved. Uh, essentially, we're, we're told that they are cut to the heart. They're feeling guilty. Christ the Messiah has been rejected. They say, what shall we do about the guilt that they have? Uh, and so what Peter says here is a solution to the question that they are asking, to the problem that they raise. And in his solution, he speaks about repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And the consequence of that is that there is reception of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I've read plenty of commentators who try to make, make the case uh, that it is indeed actually the, the profession of faith there that receives the forgiveness of sins and baptism is simply a sign of that. I, I, contextually there and linguistically, I just don't see it in the text. Um, and especially in light of everything else that we see throughout the rest of the New Testament. It, it seems very consistent to me that that's what's, what's going on. So I would say that when we look at the book of Acts, we have a lot of weird scenarios. Like we, we have first in Acts chapter two, we have a scenario where baptism seems to be pretty clearly tied to the forgiveness of sins and the reception of the spirit. Uh, but then we do have, you know, uh, Acts chapter eight and Acts chapter 10, we have instances where you know we have people who in Acts chapter eight, at uh, chapter eight, already believe, um, and then they have to have the laying on of hands and receive the Holy Spirit. So they don't even receive the Spirit in faith; they receive it when they have a later laying on of hands. And then we have you know Acts chapter ten, which is the circumstance that, that was addressed, where uh, so there is the giving of the Holy Spirit, and then baptism does does come later. So we've got kind of every possible circumstance here. Uh, it seems that in Acts, it's kind of all over the place. Like, it's not that clear uh, for, for anybody, I don't think. I don't think it fits. If we're going to say this is normative, we don't actually really have a normative paradigm in Acts in terms of the timing of all of these things and when exactly they fit together. So I think we all have to wrestle with that and say, well, why is it that, that this, is so, this is so odd? Now, um, I mean, nearly, you know, any commentator on Acts is going to recognize that there is the act of Pentecost, and there are these kind of mini Pentecosts throughout the book. And so we do have these kind of big givings of the spirit where there is, the spirit first descends on this new group of people. We have the Samaritans and we have the Gentiles um, later. So uh, I think it is the most sensible explanation that there has to be some kind of redemptive historical uniqueness, especially in Acts chapter eight, because you're, I think you're gonna struggle with how then to, to define that if, the spirit, I mean, does the spirit come through the laying on of hands? Is it, you know, like chrismation, like the Eastern Orthodox Church would say, because they try to make a case from that, from that text often. Um, 
that, hey, this is what happens. They believed and they still don't have the spirit, so they need this extra laying on of hands uh, from, from the apostles. So I think all of us kind of have to wrestle a bit with, with those texts. I just don't think it's that straightforward for, for anybody because the pattern doesn't always seem the same.